Yep. So, please begin. Okay. So, hi guys. Nice to meet you. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, changes, the most interesting changes in Apache Ignite uh, 2.12, the latest version of Apache Ignite. Uh, my name is Maxim, and uh, currently I'm working uh, in Sbertech company. It is one of the biggest IT companies in Russia, in Eastern Europe. And we have a lot of projects that run Apache Ignite. And uh, I work in a team that helped to adopt these comments to uh, uh, Apache Ignite. So I'm Apache Ignite committer, and there are my contacts on GitHub and LinkedIn. So today's agenda uh, looks like that. We touch the most interesting uh, updates in the latest version of Apache Ignite. We talk a little about cluster snapshots, C++ changes. Uh, I will talk about new major features like CDC and the Index Query API. And we touch some uh, minor but very useful updates that can uh, help you in your work. So the first uh, I want uh, to start uh, to tell uh, is a, rem a reminder about the one feature. Uh, you may not know, but it exists. It's uh, about uh, encryption uh, of data. So it's uh, Apache Ignite separates encryption of data that you store on your disk. Uh, if you have some sensitive data, you can just uh, encrypt it transparently for your applications. It's pretty easy to configure. It's pretty easy to enable. Uh, and it's production ready. You can use it. So, and if you have some any questions, you can check our documentation page about transfer data encryption. And you, and, uh, if you find it useful, it will be great. So, but uh, we had uh, one uh, trouble with encryption uh, where, uh, so for example, we have two caches. The first one is encrypted and the second one is not is a plain cache. And when we try to create a snapshot uh, for our uh, database, it skipped uh, encrypted caches and includes on the plain caches to snapshot. And now in the Apache Ignite latest version, we fix it. And now it includes encrypted caches uh, to snapshot and it is very good. So uh, what about uh, restoring? So, uh, for example, we have the cluster and now we want to restore our data from snapshot. And uh, we, we can use a control utility uh, with default command restore for snapshot. And uh, currently it restores on the plain cache and skipped encrypted cache, unfortunately. And this is a, a limitation of the 2.12, but it will be fixed soon. So, but currently it's still possible to restore the encrypted cache from snapshot using a manual procedure. So you just uh, need to move in your data from snapshot directory to working directory on the Ignite node and everything will work fine. So you have, can have uh, some details of about manual snapshot restore on our Ignite documentation site. It's pretty straightforward. If you have any question, you can ask them on user list. So as the next thing I want to tell or talk about snapshots today is restoring on a different topology. For example, you have a cluster with five nodes and they run a cache. So when you create a snapshot, and after that, you wants to add a new data. Uh, wants, you wants to add a new uh, data node to your cluster, and uh, you can uh, simply uh, run a control utility snapshot restore procedure, and it automatically finds uh, the new distribution of partitions. It's uh, transferring all required partition files from one node to another uh, during the restoring procedure, and after that, it will. Uh, restore all your data for your cluster automatically. The same works if you want to uh, restore it on the cluster with uh, that was down downsided. So, for example, you just you want to you decided to remove one node, and uh, it is the same. You can uh, restore your cluster in uh, 
full data in your cluster with control utility script. But uh, the one thing you should remember that uh, when you decided to remove one node, you should to copy the full data from this node to any other node in the cluster to make the data be available for restoring procedure. And after that, control utility script uh, do all the job automatically for you. So uh, let's go further. And uh, Apache Ignite in the latest version has a new feature, uh, change data capture. Uh, this is a common feature that uh, supported by many database system. Um, usually, actually it uh, tracks the all changes uh, in uh, tables and convert them to a stream of uh, changes or events that can be uh, sent to external system. Uh, this is very useful features that can be used for different uh, applications. For example, for example, for async replication, when you want to have a standby cluster uh, behind your production cluster, and uh, or you can want to analyze. A stream of the changers, for example, for some security audit or for calculation of statistics, so for other applications. And uh, Apache Ignite now supports it too. Uh, it's pretty easy to enable. We have a data storage configuration that has a new settings for enabling CDC. So it's just uh, very easy to configure. The limitation of this. Uh, feature in this version is that it works only for uh, caches that with enabled persistent square. Uh, it's done because Ignite CDC consumes write ahead logs that Ignite writes for every change of the data you make. So the process is pretty simple. You made some change, Ignite writes it to its write it to write ahead log, and Ignite CDC consumes this and uh, stream these changes to external system. By default, uh, Ignite provides two implementations of uh, streamers. You can find them in Ignite extensions. The first one is Ignite to Ignite streamer uh, that uh, helps you to stream changes from one Ignite cluster to another Ignite cluster. And it's uh, useful for enabling async replication. Uh, and another uh, streamer is Ignite to Kafka, is that will be useful for other uh, applications of your uh, of all your needs. So uh, we have a new uh, topic on our website with documentation that is uh, describes the process of CDC in details. So if you have any questions, you can check it and write your questions to your user list. So let's go uh, further and talk about changes in the C++. The first one is uh, C++ now enables to run, uh, to start Java compute task remotely. So there is a new compute header file that contains four methods that help you to execute tasks in a blocking on a sync way with or without optional arguments. Uh, the usage is very simple. For example, you have pre-deployed compute task, uh, for example, echo task that matches the class platform compute echo task. And uh, in C++ code, you just Get in a node, uh, get the compute object from it, and just execute uh, this task remotely. Specify name and option arguments. It's pretty simple and useful. Another thing I want, want to talk about C++ is uh, opportunity to specify affinity field name for creating caches uh, in C++. Affinity location is a very powerful feature of Apache Ignite that helps uh, you to control the distribution, distribution of the data between nodes, between partitions, and uh, it's, um, the affinity fields helps you to do it. And it was possible to do it in XML, in Java, uh, or in SQL, and now it's possible with a C++. So it's pretty simple. When you declare your new binary type, uh, in binary type default all description, there is a new method, get affinity field name, where you can specify the affinity field for uh, partition your data. Pretty simple. 
So for more details about Affinity Collocation or configuring Affinity Key, uh, you can find in our documentation page. Now it has uh, code snippets examples for C++ code, so you can check it. And do you have any questions? Uh, you can ask them on user list. So uh, the another new feature uh, in the Apache Ignite is the index query API. Uh, Apache Ignite uh, provides opportunity to create indexes uh, with query entity. So you can create index uh, without using SQL, but you uh, the only uh, way to use this index was the SQL queries. So, and uh, since a new version of Apache Ignite, you can uh, query such indexes without SQL. So you can declare indexes with query entity and query uh, directly querying with index query. Uh, so uh, it's a pretty very simple API. Because you can specify the table name, uh, index name, and specify criteria that matches your index. For example, in this example, we can see uh, querying the index with uh, to, its attempt to, to try uh, to find uh, all cache entries that matches uh, the specified criteria organization ID equals to one. So an index query returns ordered result uh, from all nodes in your cluster um, by default. So uh, it's a it is experimental, but we have some plans to uh, make this uh, feature, uh, to, 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 to add some new features to this feature and make it uh, more powerful. So you will a new uh, documentation page, you can check it. And if you have any, there are some more examples. And if you have any questions, you can ask me on the user list. So uh, another new thing in Apache Ignite is a new command in control utility that helps you to destroy caches. So before that, the, you can destroy caches with cache, uh, Java API or with GMX API. And now it's also possible with control utility. Uh, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. There are two parameters. You can specify a list of caches or decide to destroy all your caches in your cluster. Uh, another interesting thing uh, that was added in Apache Ignite, it's opportunity to configure multiple grids within the same Kubernetes network environment. Uh, for example, you want to have uh, two separate uh, Ignite grids and usually you can do it with uh, different discovery ports. So for example, you have one cluster that runs on the port uh, 47500 and another 47510. So, and now it's also possible to do it within the Kubernetes environment. So Kubernetes connection configurations now have a new method set discovery port, and you can configure uh, server grids or client nodes and thin client with these new configurations and make it uh, work in the single Kubernetes network environment. So, uh, also there are some uh, other things to mention. The first one is that IP finders for different cloud providers like AWS or Google Cloud, Zookeeper will move to Ignite extension. So if you use it and want to update to upgrade to Ignite 2.12, you should update your dependencies too. But uh, be aware that extensions is not released soon with those IP finders and you need to wait a little bit. They will be released soon. Also, new version of Apache Ignite have some skill improvements. Uh, the table statistic was added for better query planning. Uh, we improved the default values for inline indexes to make it faster. We add, we add uh, precision for var binary type if you use it. And we have some uh, questions about uh, unexpected behavior of uh, joins. Uh, Apache Ignite has a requirement for joins that they should be collocated. It means that a uh, condition of joins uh, should contain the affinity fields. And if uh, don't have affinity fields, it, it can uh, work unexpectedly. And so, so such queries that have non-collocated joins, we add the warning. So user uh, now will be um, 
notify about uh, wrong queries. So with that, we update dependencies for Apache Ignite to fix uh, known security vulnerabilities. Uh, it's a work for G, Neti, and some other uh, dependencies. And also with new release, we fixed about 60 bugs. And if you want to check all of them, you can see our release notes. They contain information about all fixes and improvements. So if you have any questions, you can check our write to our user list, DF list, or check our uh, docs on Ignite Apache Org site. So thanks all. Thank you, Max. <laughs> that was that was quite interesting. Uh, well, we've got even a pack of questions. Uh, wow. Now you can see this uh, on our on our broadcast. <laughs> yep. Wait a second. Uh, maybe <laughs> during the present uh, d during your talk, you've already answered for some of them. Just let's check. <laughs> oh, is this is a question about uh, steps for restoring the cluster uh, from, you know, from snapshot. As I remind us, Reinder, you uh, ask this question on user list. And as I understand, you didn't get answer on it. If so, I think I should to uh, answer. I will answer you on user list with this question because it's uh, there are a lot of details. I think. Yep. Yep. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Sometimes it's uh, more comfortable to come to the meeting and like attract attention. <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. some questions that we've got on the user list. Uh, guys, if you have more questions for Max, um, please send them in our chat. If you like just come to our meeting, I will remind you that uh, you can find the chat to the right, the special tab called chat. Uh, you can send your question there and um, I will show it. Um, actually, we will have some time for Q&A session in the end of our gathering of our meeting. So um, it's, it will be never late to ask. <laughs> actually, we've got a user list. So if something uh, will stay if you'll have some questions after the meeting, you can share them uh, on the user list. Um, I got the question for me <laughs> uh, about the uh, slides, about the presentation. Yep, usually just right after the, um, the meeting, like one or two days later, we post all the videos from this, um, from this uh, event on our YouTube channel that is called Apache Ignite. Uh, so, and uh, in the description, you will find all these slides. You will be able to download them and even to like watch again the session and share it with your colleagues and so on. Yep, Max. A piece of feedback, <laughs> short, clear, Thanks. great. <laughs> we like when it's clear, short, and informative. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, as I have already said, we will have some time for Q&A. And now we should move to another speaker um give me a second to make all the settings hi val i don't hear you please unmute yourself <laughs> yep I and while <laughs> yep yep <laughs> thanks and while we are preparing for the next talk you probably have found the poll uh, that we have um in our on our platform today. 
that's uh, a tab, a special tab to the right near the chat. That's kind of standard um, standard poll that we usually use every community gathering meeting. Where I just want to know whether we have a lot of uh, new uh, people that came to our meeting, someone that just started, or how many people we have here that are not totally not new for Apache Ignite. So please uh, respond to the poll and I will share the results um, in the end of the meeting uh, before the Q&A session. Okay, so Val, please, your turn to answer the questions and to present. Sure. Uh, thanks, Evgeny. Hello, hello, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining today. Um, yeah. In case, in case you don't know me, my name is Val. I am uh, one of the uh, Apache Ignite PMC members, um, a long time community member. Uh, for the last year and a half, I would say, uh, my main engagement in Ignite was working on the project that we call Ignite Three. And in case you know, in case that's the first time you hear about it, this is basically kind of an attempt to create next generation of the product, next, gener next generation of the Ignite database, uh, and it will be the next uh, major version, essentially. Um, there are certain, you know, architectural changes and uh, in the product, which we, we want to modernize it and, you know, utilize certain, you know, uh, modern technologies and modern uh, knowledge that we have in the industry, uh, like Craft Protocol, for example, and these kind of things. And there is also a strong kind of focus on the usability uh, side of things. We uh, we want to make Ignite much more you know, easier to use uh, in terms of how it's being configured, how it's being installed, upgraded, uh, started, and whatnot. So all those uh, changes are included in Ignite 3. And we're going in milestones. And as I said, I've, we've been doing this for, I, I think, since October 2020, if I'm not mistaken. And we're going in milestones, releasing like, you know, periodic uh, alpha builds, uh, which kind of demonstrates what we've achieved uh, so far. And uh, just recently, uh, January 28th, the, at the end of January, we released the uh, alpha build number four, uh, which is the fourth iterations in the series of uh, alpha releases for, uh, for Ignite 3. Uh, if you, again, if you, if you're not familiar with what's going on there, uh, with this project uh, and you want to learn more, um, I've been basically documenting everything that, that was going on. And for every release, I had like a blog post and a video as well on the YouTube. So if you're interested and you want to, uh, learn about, um, how the project is progressing uh, and what we've been doing there and, you know, what we've achieved so far. Um, here we have, you know, I have some links, uh, which you can use to, uh, and, uh, when we share the slides, you will be able to follow them. Uh, and also, of course, uh, I would, you know, encourage everyone to try, uh, to try the build on your own, to feel, you know, uh, how the, how Ignite will potentially look like in the future. Uh, there is the getting started guide in the documentation that follows you through some basic steps of how to install it and uh, you know how to start and start a node and start a cluster um, and do some basic operations and of course there are some code examples uh, as usual in our repository which you can run and uh, uh, see how it works and look at the apis and whatnot and i will show some of those examples uh, uh, today as well all right, so uh, what is the Alpha 4 build, right? So again, this is just next iteration and we are adding new new features, uh, you know, uh, into the into this project, into the in, into this next version of the project product. Um, and obviously, you know, it's an, it's, it's an active development. Uh, there are many, many changes going on um, on the architectural level, on the implementation level. But there are some features that I would like to mention and, you know, talk about them in a little bit more detail because I think they're worth uh, mentioning. So first of all is uh, pod gem mapping for table views. Uh, so I will talk about this in more detail in a minute. So basically there is this table API, the new API for data access. 
Um, and uh, now it provides the ability for automatic volume mappings. And again, I will I will talk about this in more detail and also show some code examples. Uh, the second one is data definition language. This one is fairly straightforward. Uh, this is just DDL for, for SQL. And uh, the last but not least, and probably the most exciting part is the uh, the new transactional API and the new transactional protocol. And I will uh, I will talk a little bit about the uh, what we achieved there and what we and what we want to achieve going forward as well. And then Alexi will take over and uh, dive into some details of the actual protocol and the implementation, and uh, so that you can learn more. So let's uh, let's move on and talk about those features in uh, in a little bit more detail. So let's start with the podium mappings for table view. So again, uh, if you if you if you haven't seen this API which we're developing in Ignite 3, I would definitely encourage you to look at this. Uh, so we call it Table API, and essentially the idea uh, is that we want to have a unified behavior in terms of how uh, schemas are defined and how you access the data based on those schemas. So uh, essentially, um, as in any typical SQL database, pretty much, you will define the schema first, uh, for your table when you create this table, and then you will have, but unlike with a SQL database, you will have different APIs on top of that. We call them views. So of course you, you will have SQL, but also there is uh, there are record views and the key value views APIs, which are just Java APIs and uh, which are also will be available in other platforms like .NET, C++ and whatnot. Uh, and prior to Alpha 4, uh, one of the issues with this APIs, or kind of limitations rather, was that it, it only, they could only work, those views were only, they could only work with uh, low level tuples. And tuples essentially are just, you know, uh, uh, is also the new API that we introduced, which essentially a representation of uh, sets of fields, sets of primitive fields, which represent, you know, records in the database. And uh, it, it works in, you know, <laughs> to a certain extent, but obviously it's not very convenient because uh, applications typically work with uh, kind of business level entities like Pojo classes in Java, for example, or something similar in other platforms. So it's this, this API that we've had uh, prior to Alpha 4 is essentially just too low level for most cases that we have. And what we added on top of that is we added the ability to map those tuples automatically into your project classes. So you don't actually have to, you know, uh, do those manual manip manipulations. Uh, so what will happen is that you will essentially specify which classes you want to map uh, those tuples to. So it can be a key value pair or it can be just a record, which is a single class. And Ignite will automatically, you know, introspect using reflection as usual. Uh, introspect those classes using reflection and then create this automatic mapping between tuples and the classes. And whenever you read something, it will uh, get the tuples from the database and automatically convert them into your project classes, into, into instances of those project classes and return to the application. And other way around as well, when you save something, you provide instances of project classes and they are converted automatically. <clears throat> if uh, default reflection-based mapping doesn't work for you for whatever reason, because you have some complicated structures or whatnot, uh, then there is also an option for custom mapping as well, where you just uh, code your own logic for this conversion between uh, tuples and and project classes. So let me, um, let me actually show some of the code examples that we have really quick. Uh, so uh, as I said, right, so there is the, uh, previously, the API, the table API supported uh, low level tuples. And if, if we look into this, um, that's, uh, that's the key value, key value example, which we had before alpha four. And that's the key value view, right? So the idea is that we create a table and then we get it from the API and we create the key value view for this table and key value view, uh, again, it's just a regular key value API as you know, as we're, which we're very used to obviously. Uh, but uh, this key value view by default works with tuple. So it, the key is the tuple and the value is also the is also a tuple, uh, which essentially forces you to work with uh, low level tuple API, create uh, setting the fields uh, individually into those tuples and kind of building them manually. And then whenever you uh, read something, you also kind of fetch 
individual fields from those tuples. And uh, if if you want to convert them into your application level kind of business objects, business entities, you will have to do a lot of uh, manual conversions and essentially write this logic on the application level, which you don't want uh, in many cases. Um, so we've added this capability and you can see this in this POJO example, key value view POJO example, which essentially does exactly the same. It's kind of a copy paste, but instead of uh, just getting, instead of getting a key value, uh, default key value view, which works with tuples, uh, we use this key value view method where we provide classes. We, we specify that we want a view based on the account key and the account class. And these are the classes that are specified somewhere here, I believe. Yes, so this is just the account key and the account class. And uh, and then, yeah, so you just work with a, with those objects as with regular, you know, key value API. So it's this is, this is something that, you know, uh, all of us are very, uh, familiar with. And uh, one of the advantages of this actually, which is not uh, really reflected in the example, unfortunately, but uh, what happens is that you can also have mappings which represent only subset of fields. So for example, you, you, have, a, you have a class which uh, doesn't really have this balance method, uh, balance uh, field, sorry. So what will happen is that Ignite will actually recognize this. So it will, when, when it introspects this class, it will see only two uh, fields, first name and last name, and it will compare to the schema, which has three fields. And that would actually mean that you need to fetch only two fields from the database. So I don't know if this implementation of this optimization already in place or not, but as far as I know, this should be uh, implemented maybe in future or maybe it's already there so it will essentially fetch only those two fields out of the database instead of fetching all all three or all hundred maybe that you have there um, so this is this might also be more efficient from performance standpoint as well all right um let me go back to the slides and as I said, yeah, if reflection doesn't work for whatever reason, uh, custom mappings are also supported. So data definition language. So this is, again, this is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, this is what any SQL database has. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, in Ignite 3, DDL will most likely be the way to create tables and to modify the schema. Uh, like currently there are multiple ways in Ignite 2 you can you can uh, have query entities in the uh, in the configuration. You can also use DDL, and then there is a question how you update the schema if you created it with query entities, for example. So it's kind of uh, it's a little bit cumbersome at times. So we want to unify this again. This is kind of a trend with Ignite three. So we want to unify the behavior and provide clear and concise way of doing these things. And DDL will be the way. So and we've already added this into the Ignite three. So essentially. Prior to Alpha 4, there was no proper way of doing this. There was the API uh, for creating tables, which was essentially kind of an internal API exposed. Uh, and you could see that in examples. Uh, now the old examples are converted to DDL and there was pretty much no way to alter tables properly or whatnot. So currently, so now we have the uh, DDL support. We have create table, we have alter table, drop table as with any you know SQL database. And uh, again, if you want to learn the details, uh, there is the reference in uh, in the documentation. But again, it's fairly, it's all fairly traditional and uh, something that we're all familiar familiar with. And uh, finally, uh, a big advance, big advancement in the Ignite three development is the transactional support. So essentially, uh, prior to Alpha four, there was no transactional support. Uh, and we've added the first version of uh, the new protocol and the new API. And again, Alexi will uh, talk a little bit more uh, in detail about how we achieved what, what we achieved and, you know, uh, dive into some details of the protocol and implementation. But what we uh, wanted to have is the API that is uh, as simple as possible. Uh, that is also fully asynchronous uh, in the sense that it never it never actually blocks uh, your threads unless you specifically you want to do this 
and you can use all the asynchronous operations that are also available on the table uh, table APIs and will be available for SQL as well. So you can have uh, uh, fully asynchronous transactional processing if, if that's what you're looking for. And this asynchronous processing is based on completable future, which is just the standard Java feature. And again, this simplifies the uh, the adoption. Uh, you don't have to you know, uh, learn new asynchronous API or anything like that. It's all based on the standard completable future. And if you look at the API, it's very, it's very straightforward. It's essentially just uh, start transaction and it gives you the completable future and then you can do whatever you want. And you can en enlist asynchronous operations into the chain of the execution. So it's, uh, you know, it's a very kind of uh, standard way of doing things. And uh, of course, it's uh, completable feature is for Java, but in other platforms, we're going to uh, use kind of similar approach and use you know standard capabilities of those platforms. And also, which is uh, very important if you compare it to Ignite 2, transactions are no more coupled with threads. So in Ignite 2, if you start a transaction, it is uh, asso associated with a specific thread where you started it. And uh, you can only enlist operations that are executed in the exact same thread. Uh, again, with in Ignite 3, it's going to be fully asynchronous and there is no such limitations, such, such limitation anymore. Essentially, what's going to happen is that Whenever you start a transaction, you get an object, and then you can use this transaction object to enlist any operation uh, on the API. Uh, yeah, and as I said, Alexei will Alexei will you know dive a little bit deeper into implementation stuff, so I will not <laughs> I will not spoil this. Uh, so with that, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Let's see if there are any questions, I guess. Yep, we've got um, a lot of <laughs> questions All for right. you. So give me a second. I will show you the first one from Vladimir. Can projects still be deployed manually on the Ignite 3 cluster nodes, like in Ignite 2, or maybe there is some system mechanics for that? Uh, there's going to be. So currently, uh, there is no proper mechanics. Uh, so no, actually. That's not a correct answer. No, hold on. <laughs> so those views, uh, they only work on the client side. So what happens is that whenever you uh, read something or update something, uh, the let's say you read something. So what, what will happen is that the, the Ignite will fetch tuples from the database and will do the conversion on the client side. So when we talk about those views and those pods for the views, they are only applicable to clients, so you don't need to deploy them on the server side. Uh, that's if that's if you use client APIs. Uh, if you if you, if you want when, when we have compute when we introduce compute into the picture and uh, in case you will want to use this API kind of on the server side, which is also which will be possible, uh, then yes, you will have to deploy classes, and for that, I will assume we will have some kind of a deployment mechanism. Uh, this is uh, something that is not fully designed yet, uh, and this is essentially one of the kind of next uh, next uh, steps on the roadmap. Uh, but we're definitely looking into this, so we want to avoid this uh, manual manual process that we have right now. Uh, so most likely there will be just a mechanism uh, to deploy, you know, jar files or something like that, and you know, uh, to simplify it as much as possible. But again, just stay tuned and it will be probably designed in the next few months and you will have some details. Great. Thank you. The next question from Jefferson Braswell. Is there a roadmap or plan to include access to graph databases, RDF linked open data and Spark QL to Ignite? Um, there's no roadmap for, for that, for sure. Um, uh, I think the best way for this, so if you have any use case in mind uh, for for this kind of thing, uh, we would definitely like to learn about this. Um, so if, if there is something specific, just, you know, uh, write to the dev list, uh, explain the use case, and uh, we'll look into this. Uh, this definitely sounds interesting. There is no specific roadmap or specific plan for those things, but uh, we would like to learn about the use cases and uh, see how, how we can address them. Yes, thanks. Uh, the next one, actually, we've got two questions. Um, uh, like uh, Desh Habantu 
I'm sorry if I've mispronounced the name, uh, means that GPA specification. Yeah, yeah uh, the, the short answer is no, this is, this is not, uh, this particular API doesn't follow any standard. Uh, but uh, I would say that probably we will come to this at some point. Uh, probably not in Trudeau, probably, you know, uh, in the future, potentially, uh, but uh, it should be possible to make it compliant eventually with some kind of an extension or whatnot. But this particular API is not compatible with JPI, it's just a separate API. Okay, next one from Ahmed. Isn't the Podge mapping already Ignite 2? With the Ignite Spring Data uh, extension, well, yeah, I mean, kind of like Ignite Two also obviously tries to solve this issue as well and try to solve this challenge um, in its own way. Uh, what the the beauty of Ignite Three is not that we have the mappings themselves; is that we have um, uh, what we're doing there is we're unifying the uh, the behavior about sch around schema management mainly. So again, uh, the idea is that you create the schema um, as, in, as in any SQL database, right? So you create a schema uh, using DDL, and then you work with those tables with that schema. Uh, but in Ignite, in addition to SQL, you will also have those view APIs. Uh, if you want to have key value API, or you want to have this kind of uh, uh, entity-like uh, record views as well. Uh, and those mappings uh, happen automatically. You can uh, you can use tuples as well if you want this kind of low level. If you want to work with field directly, um, which is kind of similar to binary objects in Ignite from the API perspective, although it's completely different in terms of uh, how it's implemented. Or you can work with uh, classes as well. And uh, yeah, in terms of Spring Data itself, again, this is the integration that I'm sure will appear on top of Ignite three as well. Thanks. Uh, this question for this question, one more participant uh, voted. <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of important question, I suppose. Are the Podge instances stored as JSON? No, they are not stored as, as JSON. They are stored in uh, uh, just essentially using the proprietary protocol of Ignite. So it's all so just uh, created from scratch. That we're not using any kind of uh, uh, format for this known format. Okay. Thanks. Um, hey, Courtney, <laughs> happy to see you here. <laughs> yep. And question from Courtney. Is there a clear ETA for better or GA? That's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so current ETA uh, for uh, beta is uh, around middle of this year, uh, June or July, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so most likely you will hear the news during the next Ignite Summit uh, that I'm sure Evgeny will announce if hasn't done so yet. <laughs> <laughs> so stay, stay, stay tuned for this. Uh, so the, the next Ignite Summit will, I'm pretty sure, will have some major news in terms of, uh, um, in terms of Ignite 3. Well, I should mention that com our community can also make a lot of news <laughs> by themselves <laughs> and um, come and participate and share the most interest interesting cases. So I think okay, there is um, one more question around transaction support was already there in Ignite to the DAX. Is there different than Ignite uh, transaction into the DAX? Yeah, I mean... Uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's basically, uh, so all, all these things are different from Ignite, uh, in, from Ignite 2. In Ignite 2, transactions are synchronous um, and they are coupled with, a, with specific threads. By the way, you will still be able to do this in Ignite 3, and I, I haven't mentioned this, I think. So there is, uh, there is synchronous, synchronous API on top of asynchronous API, and there are some convenience methods as well where you can you know, do those straightforward transactions where you just do start, a couple of synchronous updates, and then you commit. So you will still be able to do this. But if you have more complicated processing and you know you you want to enlist certain kind of methods of logic and these kind of things in a synchronous manner, you will be able to do this with Ignite three. And currently, this is not possible with Ignite. 
And that's that's the major difference. Yep. I would say. Thank you very much for answering all the questions. Um, I should remind to all the participants that we will have time to like look through the questions that left unanswered um, in the end of the meeting. So prepare your questions. Yep. Some feedback for you. I should show Val. <laughs> Thank oh. you. Great. <laughs> yep. Many thanks, many thanks. So, and we move on to our next speaker. Okay. Alexei, um, yep, let's. Right. So, I give <clears throat> you the stage. <laughs> I hear you. Yep, I hear you well. Now we see your slides. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Evgenia. Um, hello, Igniters. My name is Alexei Scherbekov. I work at Great Gain Systems in the position of senior architect. I am responsible for designing several core features for Apache Ignite 3, including tr the transaction support. Today, I would like to give a short presentation about a new transactions API in Apache Ignite 3. The presentation is split in four parts. A transaction lifecycle overview, how to manage transactions using the new API, examples of API usage and current limitations. A transaction lifecycle looks like this. A transaction is started, then table operations are performed in the transaction scope and in the end, uh, the transaction is committed or aborted by the user. The transaction also can be aborted by the system because of a serialization conflict or other reasons. This can happen after any transactional operation except aborting. Aborted transactions are supposed to be retried. Apache Ignite 3 supports synchronous and asynchronous API for working with transactions. The asynchronous API is based on completable future and allows chaining for truly asynchronous execution. Both methods can be mixed together without any limitations in the same transaction. Interesting fact, and in Apache Ignite 3, a transaction operation can be executed by any thread of control. This is a big difference from Apache Ignite 2, where the transaction is bound to a single thread at a time. So the number of active transactions is limited by the number of running threads. For example, any number of transactions can be executed concurrently in one thread in Apache Ignite 3. There are two different ways to manage a transaction, either explicitly or implicitly. Ignite Facade uh, contains all methods for managing a transaction. Begin is used to start a transaction. Commit or rollback is used to finish a transaction. They have asynchronous counterparts. Begin async, commit async, and rollback async. A different way to manage a transaction is using a running transaction method, accepting a closure as an argument. The closure implements transaction logic. There are two versions, the first returning a value and the second not. The transaction is implicitly started and substituted to the provided closure and will be automatically committed if no exceptions were shown during the closure execution. The closure can be automatically retried if it is designed to be idempotent. To enlist tables into a transaction, each method on the table API allows for passing a transaction instance. For example, the absurd method in record view accepts a transaction and a record. It also has an asynchronous counterpart, absurd async. Multiple operations enlisted into the same transactions transaction are executed 
atomically, either all or none. Null argument means auto commit mode. A new transaction is implicitly created for such operations and committed at the end. Let us take a look at an example. Assume the transaction transfers money from one account to another. Overdraft is not allowed. The first version demonstrates the synchronous API. We read a balance for the first account and validate it for the correct amount of money. If the validation passes, both accounts are updated. All transactions operations are performed sequentially in this example. The second version demonstrates the mixed synchronous and asynchronous API. We read both balances concurrently, and as soon as the first record is received, it's validated for the correct amount of money. If the validation passes, both accounts are updated concurrently. The third version is uh, the same as the previous one, but uses a closure style API. This version is the most compact of all in terms of written code lines. In general, this API is uh, the recommended way to work with transactions. Let's talk about current limitations. The upcoming transactions in the next alpha uh, version have some limitations because the implementation is not yet finalized. First, it works only on stable topology not restarts are not allowed. Second, the SQL doesn't support transactions. And the third, auto retries are not implemented. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Does anyone have questions? Yes, we've got a question and I will show it to you on our broadcast. Is the follow is this follow the ACID behavior? Uh, yes, uh, it is. Uh, the transactions in Apache Ignite Free will be fully ACID compliant and provide strongest isolation. Huh. I think we've got um, a question from our speaker. <laughs> He is also involved <laughs> in the process. Okay, uh, I see the question. Uh, what about transaction concurrency and transaction isolation? Are they differs? Um, we do not plan to have uh, uh, these options in Apache Ignite 3 uh, because only one isolation uh, will be always enabled. The strongest possible isolation, which is uh, like snapshot realizable isolation. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Some um, feedback for you from our participants. Yep, thanks a lot. Okay. I think that uh, we can move on to like Q&A session. Uh, I hope our speakers are ready to come uh, to the uh, stage. Yep, well, I'm adding you to. Yep. Max. Okay. Uh, so, if anyone has any questions, you can send uh, these questions to our chat. And uh, while we have like a short, <laughs> a short break, I actually uh, made something that we can have fun of. Uh, I'm still looking in the chat and I will show you uh, questions as soon as we will, uh, we will see them. And uh, what I 
suggest you to do while we are waiting for the questions. I decided to make fun. Maybe I will uh, cut it off from our YouTube <laughs> video. Uh, but anyway, that's a live broadcast and we can just try. So I, uh, I would like to ask you uh, to, and um, take part in our short like brand awareness um, quiz. So uh, please uh, go to www.menti.com and use the code or you can just use your phones and um, try to add yourself to, to the presentation. Uh, I will send you this code in our chat. So and what would be the question? A thing you associate with Apache Ignite. A thing, oh, it could be a word, several words or something like that. I'm going to make like a cloud of words uh, that would be something interesting. Um, uh, and while I'm sending you the um, information how to add yourself to this presentation, um, I'll remove it for now and we, I see the question in a chat uh, that we can try to answer. Yeah, I could take this. Uh, so what was the motivation for Apache call site in Ignite 3? So uh, yeah, generally speaking, uh, the, the H2 engine that we have, uh, we, we essentially started hitting limitations with, with the engine in terms of uh, what we can support uh, in SQL, in terms of what kind of optimizations we can introduce and this kind of, th this kind of things. Uh, and Apache call side is just essentially the, one of the best ways of uh, um, doing this uh, uh, right now. Uh, and as a matter of fact, H2 was never designed to be used in a way it, it is used in Ignite. Uh, we had to uh, do a lot of rework there internally uh, and modify the H2 itself to, to, to make it fit into the Ignite's architecture. Um, unfortunately, Apache call site did not exist when we, <laughs> when we started SQL and Ignite. Um, Apache call site is a proper way of doing this. Uh, it's the product that is designed specifically to be used in this kind of way, to be a foundation for, uh, for a distributed SQL database or any SQL database for that matter. Um, so this, trans this transition is kind of natural um, in a sense that, you know, uh, it is a better way of doing things. It also provides uh, us with a way to introduce more optimizations and to provide wider SQL support. And it's also just more overall, you know, just more efficient in terms of memory consumption and, you know, uh, CPU consumption and whatnot is just a better engine. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's, it's going to be uh, introduced to Ignite 2 as well. Uh, it's actually started in Ignite 2 before, you know, this transition started before we started Ignite 3, but when we kind of uh, uh, moved it to Ignite 3 first, now it gets its way to Ignite 2 as well. So it's not really specific to Ignite 3. It's just something that we need to do at some point. Okay, we've got the next question. Can we set atomicity level after creating the cache at a later stage? So Ignite 2, it is not possible. So this is done at the configuration, at the, at, the, at the cache creation, and essentially the only way is to kind of recreate the cache. Um, in Ignite 3, uh, if we're talking about Ignite 3, I would mention a couple of things here. So first of all, um, mo most likely Ignite 3 will be much more dynamic in a sense, in terms of what you can change in the configuration. So it has this kind of dynamic uh, um, uh, configuration engine, sorry, <laughs> which, uh, which architecturally allows, allows us to update any configurational parameters in the runtime so that you don't need, need to you know, mess with, with the configuration files in a way you have to do with Ignite 2. Uh, however, of course, uh, just updating a parameter doesn't really have 
doesn't doesn't have any effect by default. So uh, for every parameter that we can update dynamically, we will have to provide the functionality that actually does the change. Um, so we'll we'll see what exactly will be updated dynamically. As for the atomicity level specifically, it's not going to exist in Ignite three at all. So what we're essentially doing, and this is also part of this transactional uh, protocol that uh, Alexi was talking about, um, is that we basically just want to have uh, the transactional protocol that works on top of the rep replication infrastructure, which is based on Raft. And whenever you update something within a single Raft group, uh, this is essentially similar to Atomic Cache. And whenever it's a cross uh, partition or it goes across multiple Raft groups, then the transaction protocol kicks in. And this happens automatically. So you don't actually need to specify this in configuration. So atomicity, atomicity configuration will not exist in Ignite 3 at all. Uh, but it, if we look at broader configuration updates, then a lot of, a lot of updates will, will be possible. Uh, we, we are going to be possible in, uh, in Ignite 3 with this new configuration engine. OK, we've got one more question about Java 15. Signet 3 fully compatible with Java 15. Uh, Alexi, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's currently Java 11. Uh, I don't think yes, it's, been... uh, it's true. Yeah, I don't think it's been tested yet with, but I think, yeah, we're basically, we're doing this with Ignite 2 as well. So we're, uh, you know, Ignite, Java 17 is going to be our next uh, long-term uh, Java release and we are, you know, we will eventually target it for sure. So currently it's a Java 11, but it's, I think it's temporary. Uh, I was using thick client Ignite 2 and persistence enabled was not working. Uh, I think it's just basically, uh, I guess we'll need more details on that. <laughs> this is just something that you should probably just post on the user list and uh, someone will pick it up. Yes, I will have the details. Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry. I just want to say that uh, somebody already asked in user list about Java 17 and uh, uh, it was an open question, but I think uh, in our clients wants to use Java 17. So I think uh, it will, we will fix some issues and hope it will work in the future. Yeah, well, Java, like in Ignite 2, Java 17, I, uh, as far as I know, at least, it's uh, uh, it's been tested. Uh, within you know the last couple of months there was an activity so it's been tested and i, I think there are some very minor issues with it that, is, that they're being fixed some stuff with scripts or whatnot uh, overall it works uh, so yeah i think it will be uh, officially supported very soon but again with ignite 3 it's lagging in that regard but again it's temporary yep the next question of about the ignite 3 and it's using SQL. SQL processing and RuxDB for data format in memory. So RuxDB is used as one of the implementations for for the underlying storage. So Ignite 3 actually follows more kind of uh, uh, modular architecture. Uh, so we have the uh, we have the storage underneath, uh, which actually can be implemented in various ways. Uh, there is kind of an abstract API internally for, for the storage itself. And the RugsDB is just the first implementation. Uh, we picked it mostly because it was simply, you know, easy to implement uh, because it's, a, you know, ready to go storage essentially. Uh, the B tree but that we have in Ignite 2 will uh, likely be transitioned to Ignite 3 as well uh, in the next couple of months. So you will essentially be able to choose between those two. Uh, and SQL processing works on top of that. So it's kind of a, it's a different uh, company than the architecture. And it uses Apache call site and then utilizes those storage APIs uh, to uh, use a call site for yep, SQL processing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, your understanding is correct. The only thing is that RugsDB is just one of the implementations possible for the storage and other implementations uh, will be added as well. Possible to okay, use. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is error with the memory storage? Um, uh, I'm not probably. sure that it's a question. <laughs> <laughs> That's just. <laughs> oh, this is something that we, you know, that we haven't looked into in in detail. But 
I guess, you know, uh, technically, probably yes. Why not? <laughs> okay. Right, the next still on question. Java 8. Any plans to upgrade it along with the Java support in Ignite? We have currently custom image for work around. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Maxim, do you know anything about this? I checked last month and I think I see the Java 11 in the Docker container. I, I tried to find it right now. And it, uh, I don't know. I think uh, the last time it was upgraded, it was uh, 11 version and 8 version. And as I remember, it was configured externally by system parameter. I will check it right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Uh, yep, responded. Well, I think we are ready. Um, we have uh, no more questions in the chat, but uh, we will wait uh, for some time. I'm sure we will have some. And actually, I'm ready <laughs> to show some results with you guys. Um, uh, quite an interesting associations. Um, actually, you can add more. Uh, more associ associations, um, if uh, that's look like <laughs> funny for you. So we will see it uh, in a live mode, like we we can. Okay, one more question uh, from Ahmed. It's recommended to enable cache events, listen to production. If yes, is there a way to enable cache? For a specific cache, uh, yeah. So, uh, like, uh, if if you need, if you actually use those event listeners for some of the uh, you know business logic, then certainly yes. The only recommendation uh, I would have is that you should enable those only those events that you actually use. Uh, if you don't use event listeners, then don't enable them. If you do use them, enable for those events that you're using. Uh, and uh, no, there is no way to enable cache listeners for a specific cache because event API is a top level API. It's not, you know, uh, it's not coupled with any specific cache. It's just uh, listens for all the events. Okay. Thank you for your reply, okay. your response. Have yep. some res Max, response please. about yeah about Docker. As I see, we really uh, <clears throat> deliver on the eight version, but actually the Docker file is pretty simple. It can be built for eleven version with easy. I think everybody can check Docker file on our repository and do the same for eleven version. I think there is no any complex thing. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yep. this is something, you know, we, we, we can also follow up on the user list if that's still an issue. That's kind of, that's actually sounds a little weird to me because, you know, we're we're on Java 11 for a long time. It's, if there are any images that still use Java 8, it's, it's not right. <laughs> if there is anything, you know, maybe there are some images left that just point, at, point us, please, on the user list. We'll take a look. Yeah, I think we can do it. Uh, guys, uh, could you please send uh, uh, the link in our chat for user list? I mean, like, um, to save the time for the participants that are totally new to our community, <laughs> maybe that this will help, like, right now. <laughs> Or someone. So, so that's the, I can't actually, uh, I don't know about other guys, but I cannot post in the, um, in the chat. Yeah, but you can, uh, <laughs> you can send it in our private chat and I'll share with the, yep. Okay, we've got some time. Actually, I see that <laughs> some of you also participated in our short quiz. Um, yep, one more. Question from Ahmed. Mm 
looks like uh, it's about I told. Uh, is it possible to use CDC for that? Yep, just repeat it once again. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, uh, it, is, it depends on the task. So if somebody oh. wants to have audit history stored in some table or stored in some external uh, storage. So it depends on if you want to have some audit history uh, so you, in external storage or just want to consume it uh, regularly uh, as a stream so you can enable CDC and I think it will be okay. But it yeah. depends. Yeah, I think there are multiple options. And I think it's, you know, I guess, uh, Ahmed, you're asking. I think you've tried, sounds like you've tried to use event listener for this. And that might be an option uh, as well, uh, depending on requirements. Just, you know, keep in mind that event listeners that are essentially will be invoked within the update operation operations themselves. So if you like, uh, or get operations or whatnot. So let's, let's say you update something. Uh, then the event listener will be invoked within the lock for this entry. So if a, if the event listen, listener does something heavy, that probably is not the best way. If you just want to log it, for example, in the local file, then that might work. Uh, if you want to store this somewhere externally, then yeah, maybe CDC. You can also look at the continuous queries, which might be an option as well. So I guess it, I, I, I'd agree with Maxim kind of depends on requirements that you have, uh, but you do have multiple options as well. All right. Thanks. Thanks for your answers. Like, um, I just want to know if... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. That's, that's what I'm... <laughs> so it might be... It's not free for sure. I mean, any kind of audit is not going to be free. So <laughs> you're going to have a hit of some sort. Um, but I guess you will just have to choose the one that is uh, the best fit for this particular case. OK, I just have a question for our participants. If you have uh, any questions, please send them. If you have no questions and uh, today we answered uh, to we've covered all the questions that you have for now or uh, you have just something that you can go to uh, our community to um, mailing list and so on uh, so uh, please send us a plus if we can like end today's uh, community get gathering and uh, and we have answered all the questions you have for now. And like, looks like we're, we come to the end of our meeting. And I will remind you one, once again uh, to participate in our Ignite Summit, bring your cases, share your, share your experience, that would be interesting for all of us. Yep, and uh, we've got... <laughs> oh, one more question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Is it recommended yep. to use list as a cache value type? How long that list can grow? I mean, uh, you can do that. So it's not, obviously it's not prohibited. Um, if it grows, but uh, there are, there are some implications. Basically, uh, Ignite will work with this list as a single object. So whenever you read it, let's say it will, you know, uh, it will deserialize it and this kind of thing. So uh, this can have certain performance hit, especially if you store long lists with a lot of items. Um, how much exactly it will it can grow? Obviously, it depends on the the requirements that you have in terms of performance and how you actually use it. So it's uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, but if you, you know, if it's not predictable, if the list of uh, the size of the list can be essentially indefinite, I would probably store the items as uh, separate uh, records in like a separate cache. And then, you know, if you need to gather them, just use SQL uh, or the actually the new index API that that that, that Maxim was showing might might also be a good fit for this for this kind of thing. Uh, so you, uh, the, the short answer is that, yeah, you technically can do this. Uh, 
uh, but there are certain you know uh, conditions where it will have a where it can become a bottleneck where it will be definitely performance hit and uh, basic way to avoid this is just to store elements as a separate cache it might it will be more complicated in terms of the code that you have to write and whatnot but it will probably be better from a performance standpoint Again, from yep. Ignite internals perspective, it's just an object. <laughs> it's uh, it will be serialized, and you know, the more items you have, the larger the object is, and uh, it does it does have implications uh, for sure. Oh, I have a very good use case to share. Great, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy. You can't even I'm, imagine how. I'm I'll. <laughs> I'll send you, I've sent uh, my um, working email, so just uh, let me know uh, what kind of case it could be. I suppose I have your uh, email, um, you, the email you've registered with for this event, so I will try to find it and reply you somehow, but anyway, if anyone wants to contact me and uh, take part not only in our summit but um, something like this community gathering and present uh, a case present share the experience anything uh, please let me know and we will discuss and prepare with you something interesting we are ready to communicate to share ideas and so on Yep, looks like um, looks like we got uh, no more questions for now. I will send. Um, I've sent you my email in case of emergency. <laughs> you can contact me, and I will try to answer your questions or try to find someone who can answer. <laughs> um, and give you the opportunity to share your knowledge. So, great, <laughs> thanks. So thank you guys. Uh, thank you all for participating, for coming, for making this meeting, uh, this gathering interesting. Thank you, Max. Alexei, Val for coming, presenting, preparing. Uh, I know that this requires a lot of time and you've <laughs> spent this time and just many things. I hope that helped our participants to find a way and uh, to start the way maybe. Thank you all. Thank See you. Ya. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.